Uh, if you remember, uh, the first thing factories will normally do is actually forecasting, right? Because they need to know what the customer wants. They have to forecast the customer demand first uh, before they can start the production. So after forecasting, uh, they will proceed. Uh, they will proceed to some kind of planning first, okay, before they can start production. So one of the important types of planning is called capacity planning. Uh. So it means that company have to check their capacity and they have to plan their capacity first before they can really start production. They have to plan their capacity in such a way uh, to make sure that they can fulfill all the customer orders. Right, so this is where uh, we have to study capacity planning. Huh? <laughs> okay, so we start with some definitions, okay, some concepts, and then later we will look at the models, the tools, the techniques that we can use for capacity analysis. Huh? Right, so definition, huh? what is capacity? Capacity is actually the throughput, okay, or the number of units a factory or a facility can hold, receive, store, or produce in a period of time. Okay, so uh, whatever the number of units a factory can produce, plus the number of units of products that uh, the factory can receive from the suppliers, plus the number of units of products that the factory can keep in the warehouse. If you total up all this, that is the capacity of the factory yeah, or facility. So it's actually the number of units a factory can hold, can receive from suppliers, can store in a warehouse, can produce yeah, in a period of time. Um, capacity is important uh, because it will determine the fixed cost of a factory. Okay, an example of fixed cost is the cost of uh, setting up the factory, uh, the cost of building a factory, the cost of setting up the facility in the factory. Those are fixed costs of a factory. So if let's say uh, the factory requires a larger capacity, then it means that you will have to set up a larger factory. And if you need a larger factory, then it means the fixed cost will increase. So capacity basically affects the fixed cost. And capacity will also determine if demand will be satisfied or not. Right? So if um, the capacity is enough to satisfy the demand, then the demand will be satisfied. If your capacity is insufficient, then most likely you have to do something else. Most likely you have to buy from suppliers, you have to do subcontracting, you have to subcon your work to a subcontractor. You have to hire more employees to build up your capacity and so forth. And capacity planning can be divided into three time horizons. Huh? Right, so we can have planning, capacity planning for the long term, for the intermediate or the mid term, as well as for the short term. Now, long term planning, huh? long term planning is more planning or deciding. Uh, whether we should add new facilities or not, okay? whether we should add a new production system, a new production line, a new facilities or not, and also deciding whether we should add more equipment or not. So that is more like long-term planning, huh? deciding whether to set up a new facilities, to buy new machines or not, these are long-term planning. Uh, Medium-term planning is more on planning or deciding whether we should uh, employ more workers whether we should add more employees or whether we should lay off unnecessary employees and also deciding whether we should keep more inventory or use up our inventory. So these are for medium-term planning. Huh? And for short-term planning, uh, normally we are dealing with uh, issues that we have to do daily or weekly. For example, um, planning or scheduling jobs to be performed, uh, scheduling employees, personnel, as well as allocating jobs to machines. Uh, there are two types of capacity. Eh? <clears throat> there are two types of capacity. First is called design capacity. Second is called effective capacity. Okay, so design capacity is the maximum theoretical output of the system. 
So it's like the ideal, uh, the ideal theoretical value of a system. Okay, the ideal maximum value of a system. Normally, capacity is expressed as a grade, uh, as a grade. For example, number of products that can be produced per hour, or number of products that can be produced per day, or number of products that can be produced per week. So normally, it's expressed as a grade. Uh, uh, another type of capacity is called effective capacity. Yeah? Effective capacity is capacity a firm expects to achieve even current operating constraints. So normally, effective capacity is lower than design capacity. Okay, and effective capacity is also expressed as a rate. Eh? Uh, if you don't understand, then uh, understand it like uh, like your car. Okay, if you buy a new car, for example. Uh, if you look at the speed of the car, okay, if you look at the dashboard of the car, the maximum speed of a car is normally about how much? 220, 220 kilometer per hour. All right, if you look at the dashboard, uh, the speed of your car, the maximum speed that you can go is 220 kilometer per hour. Okay, normally 220, right? So that is like the design capacity of the car. Okay, is the maximum theoretical speed. That the car can go it's like the ideal uh, ideal maximum value right but the effective capacity of a car can never be 220 kilometer per hour right because when you drive the car you can never reach 220 kilometer per hour uh, because of road conditions because of traffic jam and even if you're driving the highway uh, you can never drive 220 kilometer per hour because of the speed limit imposed by the authority right so if you drive in the highway the maximum you can go if you follow the speed limit it is only 110 kilometer per hour that 110 kilometer per hour is like the effective capacity right 220 kilometer per hour is the design capacity capacity of the car but when you really drive it on the highway on the road, given the current operating constraints, you can only drive up to 110 km per hour. So that is like the effective capacity yeah, of the car. So effective capacity is normally lower than the design capacity. Right, so once you understand uh, the <coughs> capacity, yeah, the design capacity and the effective capacity, then we can calculate two important measures, uh, which are called utilization and efficiency. So utilization is actually the actual output that you achieve. Okay, we're talking about production, uh, we're not talking about cars. Uh. We're talking about production, so the actual number of outputs that can be produced divided by the design capacity. So that will give us the utilization rate. And efficiency is equal to the actual number of outputs produced divided by the effective capacity. All right, so a lot of people confuse between utilization and efficiency. Yeah? Actually, they are the same. Okay, you're using the actual number of outputs that you produce, but then you divide with different things. Yeah? For utilization, you divide it with the design capacity, but for efficiency, you divide it with the effective capacity. Right, remember as design capacity, this is the maximum theoretical value that you will get. Effective capacity is the practical value that you will get. Okay, subjected to real operating constraints. Okay, so look at one example to make you understand. Huh? Let's say there's a bakery, yeah. There is a bakery. Okay, a uh, bakery makes uh, bread, huh? uh, bread or bread, okay. Depends how you pronounce it. Okay, in the UK they call it bread. In the US they pronounce it as uh, bread. Okay, so a bakery makes bread or bread or it makes cakes or whatever. Okay, so you have a bakery. The actual production, the actual number of outputs achieved last week, uh, is one hundred forty-eight thousand rows. Okay, per week, uh, Okay, just understand it uh, a week. That is the actual number of outputs achieved, 148,000 rows per week. The effective capacity of the bakery is 175,000 rows. Okay, again, per week. Uh. 
And the design capacity of the system of the battery is given as 1,002 rows per hour. Okay, and it says that the battery operates seven days per week and three shifts per day. Eh? Each of the shift is eight hours. So it means the battery operates three eight hours shift per day. Okay, so it's not three to eight hours shift. Eh? It's uh, three shift per day, but then each shift is eight hours. All right, so what you need to do uh, design capacity is given as number of rows per hour. So it would be wise if we convert it to number of rows per week. Okay. Okay. So if we convert it to uh, design capacity, yeah, if you convert it to rows per week, then it means it's equals to 1002 okay, per hour, right? Times 7, times 3, times 8. Okay, because every week the company operates seven days, every day it operates three shifts, and each shift is eight hours. All right, so thousand two times seven times three times eight will give us two zero one six zero zero rows. Okay, rows of bread or cakes. So that is the capacity, yeah, two zero one six zero zero rows per week. Okay, so once we know the design capacity, once we know the effective capacity. And once we know the actual production, we can actually calculate the utilization and also the efficiency. All right? So how to calculate utilization? Utilization is the actual output. Okay, actual output, uh, which is this value. Okay, divided by design capacity, which is two one six. Uh, sorry, two zero one six zero zero. So you will get seventy three point four percent. Uh, Okay, and to calculate efficiency, efficiency is equal to the actual output, which is 14800 divided by the effective capacity. Effective capacity is 175000. Huh? Okay, so you will get 84.6%. All right, so I hope it's simple. Huh? Okay, so let's say now. Let's say now uh, you want to install a new production line or a new production system in the bakery. Okay, and the efficiency of the new production line is 75%. All right, so if the efficiency of the new production line is given as 75%, then what will be the output, the expected output or the actual output that you will get? Okay, very easy. Just calculate it like this. Okay, so expected output is equals to effective capacity times efficiency. Okay, because just now I said output. Okay, equals to, equals to what? Effective capacity times efficiency. Okay, why? Because we know that efficiency, <coughs> okay, efficiency equals to actual output divided by effective capacity. Okay, so if you want to find the output, we just use the effective capacity times the or multiply the efficiency. Okay, so if we have a new production line, the efficiency is 75%, then the output is just equal to the efficiency 75% times the effective capacity of the system, which is 17500. And you'll get 131250 rows. Okay, rows of bread and rows of cake. Huh? Okay, any questions so far? No? Okay, now that I continue. Huh? 
Uh, when we do capacity planning, uh, we have to consider these things. Uh, first, of course, as I said, you have to forecast demand accurately. Yeah, because the demand that you have forecasted will determine uh, how much capacity that you plan. Right? So based on the demand that you have forecasted, the second thing you have to do is you have to match your capacity. Yeah? Match your capacity or your technology increments or your process capacity. You match it with the sales volume. The sales volume is the demand or the sales that you have forecasted. Right? And three, normally we will also have to find what is the optimum production size. What is the optimum production lot size or the volume okay, that you have to produce so that we can meet the demand? And fourth step is uh, factories always have to be flexible. Eh? They always have to be ready for change. Eh? In case if the customer demand change, then they will have to be ready to change their capacity. So it means they have to be flexible uh, to change, to change their capacity. Eh? Right, so how do we manage demand and capacity? Yeah, there are some scenarios here. For example, if uh, demand exceeds capacity, customer demand exceeds factory capacity. So what should the factory do? Huh? What should uh, the producer do? Okay, it's just like oil. Huh? Look at oil now, gas now. Uh, demand for oil, demand for gas has actually exceeds the capacity, huh? the production capacity. It has exceeded the supply, okay, due to the war between Ukraine and Russia and due to the sanctions imposed on Russia. So what, what should the, be the response if demand exceeds capacity? Okay, you will find that first thing, what the market will do is they will try to curtail the demand, huh? means uh, stop the demand, okay, or reduce the demand by increasing the prices. Okay, this is why uh, now all the all the oil, oil price, uh, the gas price, oil price has actually increased. Uh. Okay, the reason is actually to curtail demand uh, because if you increase the price, we are hoping that uh, people will not buy it. Okay, people will stop buying it or people will demand less oil. Right, but uh, this will not solve the problem in the long term because we need oil. Uh. People need oil, need gas to, to start production, to survive. Uh. Right, so one of the strategies is to increase the price, but it's not a very effective strategy. Okay, another strategy is uh, we can schedule longer lead time. Okay, so in other words, it means that we try to buy time. Huh? We try to buy time uh, so that we have more time to make the product. Okay, and this will actually help to uh, fulfill the demand later. Huh? So it means you won't fulfill the demand on time. Hey, you try to buy time, you tell the customer you have to wait, we will need more time to produce it, and then later we will send it to you. Okay, so that is scheduling longer lead time. Okay, but a uh, more effective strategy is actually we have to increase capacity. Yeah? So let's say now in the market there is not enough oil and gas, what we have to do is we have to increase our capacity. Okay, we have to ask more companies to go and find oil, you dig for oil, for example, you go and talk to Slumberjay, talk to company like uh, Halliburton, Slumberjay, these are the companies that go for, you know, finding oil eh, in the offshore. Right? So we have to increase capacity, eh? demands exceed capacity. Now, what happens if you have a difference in a relative capacity exceeds demand? Okay, it means your factory has a lot of capacity, you can produce a lot, uh, but then customer doesn't require so much. Okay, uh, examples, if you look at the property market, uh, if you look at the property market, houses. Okay, nowadays, uh, contractors just keep building houses, but then there's no demand. Okay, especially if you uh, see in JB, uh, in KL maybe there are a lot of demand, uh, okay, but in JB, Malaysia, you see a lot of new apartments, new houses, built everywhere in JB, but then uh, there are no buyers. All the apartments are empty, uh, vacant. Okay, a good example is if you go to uh, Country Garden, uh, if you go to Country Garden, you know Country Garden, uh, in JB. If you go there, you will see that uh, there are a lot of uh, lux luxurious, high-end apartments, houses, but then there are no buyers, empty, vacant. 
Okay, so that is an example of a capacity exit demand. Eh? So when this happens, what should we do? We should stimulate the market. Okay, stimulate the market means uh, try to do promotion, advertisement. Okay, we try to stimulate the market so that we encourage buyers to actually buy the products. Okay, and if market stimulation doesn't work, then we may have to think of changing the product. Okay, for example, uh, customers cannot afford to buy high-end houses. So what do we do? We have to change the product. Instead of building uh, high-end houses, we need to build low-cost houses, which is more affordable, so that people can buy the houses. Right? Okay. So pop quiz, I already explained what you should do with demand exit capacity. <coughs> First, increase prices. Second, schedule longer lead time. Third, you have to adjust your capacity. You have to improve your capacity. All right? And two, what happens if capacity exit demand? First thing you have to do is you have to stimulate the market. And second, if it doesn't work, okay, second thing you should do is you have to change the product. All right? So these are some tactics or strategies where you can match capacity to demand. Huh? So first thing you can do is make staffing changes. Okay, for example, uh, you do not have enough capacity to meet customer demand. Then you have to make changes in your staffing requirements. Huh? So it means that you have to employ more workers so that with more workers, you can increase your capacity. Right, but if you have more than enough capacity, then you may Consider laying off the unnecessary employees. Okay, and second thing that you have to do is, or okay, that you can do is adjust equipment. Huh? How to adjust equipment, purchase additional mach machines or equipment. If you do not have enough capacity, you have to purchase additional machine. Right, but if you have more than enough capacity, then you may want to consider selling out the equipment or leasing out the equipment to some other companies. Third, improving processes to increase throughput. Eh? So for example, if you do not have enough capacity, then you have to improve your processes so that uh, the capacity of the processes can be improved. Eh? How do we improve processes? Normally, we simplify the processes or we automate the processes okay, using robots and automation technology. Fourth, uh, redesigning products to facilitate more output. Okay, so imagine you don't have enough capacity to make the product because the product is very complicated. It takes a very long lead time to make the product. Then you will have to redesign the products. You have to simplify the product. Okay, so by simplifying the product, uh, you can make it in a shorter time. So in other words, you will have more capacity yeah, to make the product. Right, and of course, uh, if you have more than enough capacity, you can also consider closing down your factory. Yeah? So you can close down your facilities. You don't need the facility. Okay, so now we move on to analysis. Eh? Okay, capacity analysis. So there are many types of capacity analysis. Okay, um, the first one you will study is called bottleneck analysis. So bottleneck analysis is a kind of analysis that helps you to determine throughput capacity of workstations in a system. Okay, now each work area in a system has its own unique capacity. So you have to understand this. Each work area in a production system has its own unique capacity. Okay, for example, a production line. Okay, an assembly line, a huh? production line, uh, production line consists of several workstations, right? So each of these workstations has their own capacity. So in this bottleneck analysis, what we need to do is we actually need to find out where is the bottleneck workstation. Okay, you understand what is bottleneck? Huh? Bottleneck is actually a limiting factor or constraint. A bottleneck workstation will has the lowest effective capacity in system. Okay, bottleneck, uh, you look at the bottle, uh, a, bottle uh, a bottle is like this, right? A bottle. Okay, for example, you have a bottle like this. 
So this is the neck, right? So this is where you will find the bottleneck. So this is the bottleneck. So why is it called a bottleneck? Because this is the place where problems will occur, eh? where the flow will be affected. Okay, imagine this is this is road. Eh? You're driving in a highway, okay? So initially there are three lanes, okay, as wide as this three lanes. So the cars can drive on three lanes. But then suddenly when it reaches this bottleneck, it becomes one lane. So all the cars will have to slow down and slowly squeeze into the single lane, right? So this is where the traffic jam happens. So that's why this is called bottleneck. So bottleneck is a place where problem happens, where congestion or traffic jam happens. Okay, in production we don't call it traffic jam, but in production we call it bottleneck. So it means that is the place where uh, the production will be affected. Okay, and a bottleneck workstation is actually the workstation that has the lowest effective capacity in the entire system. Huh? Okay, uh, 49 students. Okay, better than expected, okay, because uh, we have more than 50 students huh, in both sections. Okay, but every week when I check the list of participants, maximum we can get is about 49 or 48. Okay, let's continue. <clears throat> So bottleneck analysis, so imagine you have an assembly line, production line that has three workstations, eh? workstation one, workstation two, workstation three. Okay, the cycle time of the first workstation is two minutes per unit. So it means it requires two minutes to complete a unit. Once it's completed, the unit is passed to the second workstation. The cycle, the cycle time of this workstation is four minutes per unit. Okay, and then once it's completed, it's passed to the third workstation, workstation C, and the cycle time of workstation C is three minutes. Right? So can can anyone tell me in this production line which workstation is the bottleneck station? Station B. Okay, anyone? A. Okay. A. Uh, who is who is who is speaking? Okay, you have to let me know your name now so that I can I can give you more marks for class participation. Okay, what is your name? Okay, that the that Okay, you type in the you type in the chat, okay? Or Ayman is it? Okay, Ayman say workstation A is the bottleneck. Okay, uh if you look at the chat. Faiz, Faiz Yako, uh, say workstation C. Cairo, say workstation B. 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 B, okay, so all of you say B, okay, so correct. Uh. The bottleneck workstation is workstation B, okay, because, okay, um, A bottleneck workstation has the lowest effective capacity in the system, so it means that a bottleneck station will normally has the longest cycle time, has the longest production time. Okay, so a bottleneck time is the time of the slowest workstation. Okay, the workstation that takes the longest time in the production system. Right, so workstation B is actually the bottleneck workstation. Huh? So uh, when we do bottleneck analysis, uh, we always try to identify where is the bottleneck workstation. Okay, because knowing this bottleneck workstation is important huh? because this bottleneck workstation will determine the effective capacity of the entire production line. Okay, understand? Huh? So if you look at workstation A, workstation A is fast, right? It's faster than workstation B because the cycle time is smaller. So it can complete the unit in two minutes. Okay, but then uh, it, it doesn't contribute to the uh, capacity of the entire line huh? because this entire line is actually constrained or restricted by workstation B. Okay, because workstation B needs four minutes. Okay, so it means the fastest the unit can 
come out from the entire production line is after four minutes. All right, even though A is fast, it pass to B, but then B is slow. B will take four minutes. Okay, and it pass to C, C takes three minutes. So even though C is faster than B, uh, it will not affect the capacity of the entire line. Okay, the capacity of the entire line is affected by the auto network station. Okay, so imagine this is a chain. Uh, this is a chain. Okay, uh, the entire chain is affected by this. Okay, by this workstation B. All right. Okay. So, what is throughput time? You know bottleneck time. You know bottleneck workstation. What is throughput time? Uh, throughput time is the time it takes for a unit to go through production from the start until the end. Eh? So the throughput time starts from here until here. So that is the throughput time. So in this case, the throughput time okay, uh, for this product to go through the entire system is 2 plus 4 plus 3, yeah? so which is 9, yeah? 9 minutes. Okay, 6 plus 3 minutes. All right, okay. So look at one example. Yeah? We need to do the bottleneck analysis. Okay, let's say there is uh, two identical sandwich lines. Okay, um, I think all of you have uh, have been to Subway before, right? Subway. Subway to eat sandwiches, breads, or buy breads. Okay, so this process flow is something like the process flow in Subway. Eh? Okay, first you arrive, you, you, you give your order. Okay, you order your bread. Okay, so ordering itself will take 30 seconds. Okay, so once your order is confirmed, then the operator will prepare the bread or the grade for you. Right, it will choose the bread, choose the grade. Okay, that will take 15 seconds. So that uh, the operator will do all the filling. Okay, it will fill in the cheese for you, the meat, the vegetable, the sauce. And once the filling is completed, uh, normally the operator will put okay, the package into the toaster eh, to toast it. To heat it up so that process will take 20 seconds after toasting then they will wrap it and deliver to you so that wrapping and deliver process takes 37.5 seconds okay so in the textbook uh, from here to here is called the line huh? this is the production line so you have two identical sandwich line okay so the lines have two workers and three operations uh, so you have two workers one worker is over here Okay, another operator is, is over here. Two operators looking at uh, looking at two lines, but then there are three operations. Huh? Okay, okay. So if you look at the line itself, where is the bottom network station? Here. Huh? Okay, but if you look at the entire system itself. This station is the bottleneck station. Okay, okay. So what it says is the two lines uh, can each deliver a sandwich every 20 seconds. Okay, correct. Okay, imagine the line is from here to here. Uh, I already said this is the line. Because the bottleneck station is 20 seconds, so the two lines each means each of the two lines can deliver a sand sandwich every 20 seconds. And if you look at the entire system, uh, the bottleneck station is this station. Okay, it has a cycle time of 37.5. Huh? So the wrapping and delivery station has the longest processing time and therefore it is the bottleneck. All right, okay. So the question asks you, what is the capacity of the entire system? What is the capacity per hour of the entire system? Okay, it's just equals to 3600 divided by 37.5. Okay, capacity per hour uh, means every hour, uh, how much, uh, how many breads can be produced from this system. Okay, so one hour is equal to 3600 seconds. So 3600 seconds divided by the bottleneck station time, uh, which is 37.5. The answer is 96. Uh. 
right? So it means that every hour, this company, this whole system, imagine Subway, yeah, can only produce 96 sandwiches every hour. And what is the throughput time? Throughput time, as I said, is the time from the start until the end. So you just add up 30 plus 15, plus 20 plus 20, plus 37.5, you get 1 to 2.5. Okay, okay. So another example. Um, this is what this is a process at clinic, yeah? Okay, a dentist clinic for cleaning teeth. So processes are you check in, take x-ray of your teeth, and then the x-ray is being developed. Okay, so based on the x-ray, uh if cleaning is needed, then you will go through the cleaning, the teeth will be clean. If cleaning is not required, uh, for example, if the x-ray requires further examination or further test, further testing, then they will go for further testing for the x-ray examination. After that, uh, there will be consultation with the dentist, and after that, check out. Huh? Right, so just let me ask you a quick question. What is the capacity per hour of this entire system? Okay, anyone can tell me? What is the capacity per hour of this entire system? Sixty divided by twenty-four. Okay, all right. Yeah, that's the answer. Yeah, simple, right? So uh, that's because the bottleneck happens here at the cleaning process. Right, so once we know the bottleneck, then we can calculate the capacity. So if you're asked to calculate the hourly capacity means capacity per hour, then you use 60 minutes divided by 24, you get 2.5. Okay, very simple, right? Okay, so the throughput time you can calculate, huh? the throughput time because uh, we, we have, we have uh, two path here, one path and another path here. So the throughput time will be different for the different path. So the throughput time, if uh, we are taking the X-ray exam, is this value, and if the throughput time for the cleaning power will be this value. Okay. Okay. So I think you understand. It's simple. Right, so if you have a bottleneck, how do we manage our bottleneck? Eh? Okay, first is uh, try to release work orders. Is try to uh, start the production eh? at a pace set by the bottleneck. Okay, understand? Eh? So imagine if your bottleneck workstation has a cycle time of 60 minutes, for example. Eh? Uh, then it means that you should release the work orders only after 60 minutes. Okay, because uh, the entire capacity is affected by the bottleneck workstation. Bottleneck has a cycle time of 60 minutes. Then you shouldn't release your work order every minute. If you release it every minute, then a long jam will be created. Okay, so try to release the work orders following the time of the bottleneck workstation. So if the bottom network station have a cycle time of 60 minutes, then you can release the work order every 60 minutes. Right, second thing is uh, lost time at the bottleneck represent lost time of the whole system. Okay, I already explained this. And third thing, uh, never try to increase the capacity of non-bottleneck station. Huh? Because increasing the capacity of a non-bottleneck station is a mirage. Okay, what is a mirage? Mirage is like a fantasy, a fantasy yeah, or illusion. Okay, fantasy or illusion that means it does not work. All right, so there's no point to increase the capacity of a non bottleneck station because it will never help to increase the capacity of the entire system. If you want to increase the capacity of the entire system, you should focus on increasing the capacity of the bottleneck station. Because if you can increase the capacity of the bottleneck station, then you can increase the capacity of the whole system. OK, 
Okay, okay. So let's go to the uh, interesting technique. Eh? So one of the way for people to manage bottleneck, okay, or to reduce bottleneck of a production line or production system is called line balancing. Okay, so line balancing is done for manual assembly line. Eh? It cannot be done for automated assembly line. Please remember that if you have a manual assembly line where each workstation is handled by an operator, then you can do line balancing. So what is line balancing? As I said, line balancing is for us to solve the bottleneck issue, for us to reduce the bottleneck issue. Okay, so how do we solve the bottleneck issue? Uh, we can rearrange the work element. Okay, we can rearrange the work element at each workstation so that the total time of each workstation is almost the same. That is line balancing. Eh? Line balancing requires us to uh, reassign jobs or work elements into the workstation or redistribute, eh? redistribute the work elements into workstation, into different workstation, so that at the end, every workstation will have almost the same cycle time. Right? So if every workstation has the same cycle time, then you will get a perfectly balanced line and smooth assembly flow can be achieved. Okay, however, in practice, uh, it is not always possible to do this. Huh? Right, so if the time is not equal, then as I said before, the bottleneck station, huh? the slowest workstation will determine the effective output rate or the effective capacity of the whole assembly line. Okay, so if you look at this, then maybe you can understand better. Eh? So for example, there is an assembly line or production line consisting of seven stations, seven workstations. Right, as mentioned before, each workstation has their own capacity. So each workstation can have different cycle time. Eh? So for example, the first workstation, this is the cycle time. Second workstation, this is the cycle time. Okay, third workstation, this is the cycle time. So so if you look at this, this bar chart, eh? so it's very clear that workstation three is the bottleneck workstation. This is the station with the slowest, uh, slowest performance or the highest cycle time. And workstation five is actually the fastest station that has the smallest cycle time. Right, so if you look at this, okay, what you can say? Okay, you can say that the line is actually not balanced. Right, it's not perfectly balanced. If a line is perfectly balanced, then every workstation should have uh, the same cycle time, or roughly or approximately the same cycle time. Okay, but this is not the case. Eh? You can see the cycle time are very different, different workstation, and because of that, this line is not balanced. And because of that, also the capacity of this whole assembly line is actually determined by this bottleneck workstation. Right, so I repeat what I say, yeah? line is not balanced because the time or the workload between the workstation is not equal. And because of that, the workstation with the longest time, which is workstation 3, will actually determine the overall capacity of the SMD line. Okay, okay. So what we want to do now is we want to apply line balancing technique Okay, to balance up this SMD line. Okay, how to do that? We have to reassign the work elements. We have to redistribute the work elements to the different workstations so that each workstation will then have roughly the same cycle time. Okay, so <clears throat> before I explain the techniques, there are some mathematical symbols that you have to understand first. Eh? Okay, there are many mathematical symbols that you have to understand. Okay, what time now? Okay, do you want to take a break for five minutes? Okay, I'll take a break for five minutes, huh? And then I will continue with this line balancing.
Ok, let me continue. Eh? Ok, before I explain how to do line balancing, there are some symbols, some mathematical symbols, some formulas that you have to understand first. Uh, first symbol is called TEJ. Eh? TEJ is the time of a particular work element. Okay, TEJ is the time of a particular work element. Now, when we say work element, it means it is the smallest work element that is identified during time study. You have taken work design time study before, right? I think last semester. So when we do time study, uh, when we want to measure the time of a job, 
we don't measure the time of the entire job, right? We have to break down the job into the basic work element first, and then we measure the time of each of the individual elements. All right? Okay, so this is the work element that we are meaning, which we are referring here. It is the smallest element of work that is identified during time study. So that is TEJ. Eh? Another symbol you have to understand is uh, total work content, eh? TWC. So total work content is actually the total time of all the work elements. If you total up all the time for all the work elements, you will get the total time for the work content. Eh? So in short, we just call it total work content. So it's actually the total time of the entire work content. And the next symbol is TSI. Eh? TSI is the time of a particular workstation. Right? So a workstation may consist of, let's say, three work elements. So if you total up the time for those three work elements, it gives you the time of that workstation. Okay, that's why it's written here TSI equals to summation TEJ. Yeah? Okay, when J equals to 1 to N. So it depends on how many elements the workstation has. If the workstation has four elements, then you total up the time for those four elements, you get the time for the workstation. Right, so workstation time is different for it's different from uh, it's different from total work content. Uh. Total work content is you total up all the time for all the work elements. Right, so in other words, total work content is equal to the total of all the workstation time. Okay, hope you understand. Uh, cycle time. Cycle time is the time between successive output. Coming out of the line at a steady state stage. Right? So normally cycle time is calculated as T divided by Q. Huh? So cycle time PC is calculated as T divided by Q. Huh? T is the production time allocated. Q is the quantity to be produced. Okay? So if let's say the production time allocated for the production of a particular product or for the assembly line, 60 minutes. Okay, and the quantity to be produced is 60. Then it means the cycle time is one minute. Okay, simple. Huh? Next, uh, demand rate. Okay, demand rate is. Q divided by T, eh? so it's actually demand rate. Eh? Demand rate is actually equals to Q divided by T. Eh? So in other words, it's equals to 1 divided by cycle time. Okay, uh, demand rate. Eh? I don't know why the textbook called demand. It's confusing. It's actually the demand rate. So demand rate is Q divided by T, quantity to be produced, divided by production time allocated. Or oh, is this equal to 1 divided by the cycle time? And what else? Idle time. Idle time of a workstation. So idle time of a workstation is calculated as the cycle time minus the workstation time or the workstation time minus the cycle time. Okay. The idle time of workstation is equal to the workstation time minus the cycle time. Or it could be the other way. Eh? It could be cycle time minus the workstation time. Okay. The difference is whether you get positive or negative sign. Right, and there is a measure which is called line balancing efficiency. Yeah? Okay, before this, before this, uh, before this, uh, we calculate line balancing loss. Okay, line balancing loss is equals to this formula. Yeah? N, N is the number of workstations that you have multiplied with the cycle time. 
Okay, multiply with cycle time minus total work content. What is total work content? It's the summation of all the work element time. Then divide by n times pc cycle time. Okay, so line balancing loss is equal to this formula. Uh, later, later you can refer to the notes. Uh, and another measure is called line balancing efficiency LBT. So formulas are also about the same. Huh? This also equals to N times DC, but then you minus the total idle time. Okay, and then divide back by N times DC. Huh? Okay, N is number of workstation, DC is the cycle time. Huh? T idle is the total idle time. So these two formulas are the same, right? About the same, huh? This one is this part here. Okay, for line balancing loss, you minus with the total work content, which is the total of all the element times. Okay, but for line balancing efficiency, you minus total idle time. Okay, okay. Uh, when you do line balancing, you also have to understand uh, precedence constraints uh, or precedence relationship. Okay, so what is that? Uh, normally, you can understand it from a diagram like this. Uh. So let's say you have an assembly line. The assembly line consists of a total of 12 work elements. Not 12 work stations. Uh, different. Uh. Let's say the assembly line consists of 12 work elements. The entire assembly line to perform the job, it has a total of 12 work elements. Okay, so these work elements have certain precedence constraints or precedence relationship that has to be followed. Okay, for example, if we look at work element one and two, eh? so work element one and two can be started first because before work element one and two, there are no other elements. Understand? But work element three, can only be started after work element one has been completed. So this is what we call the precedence constraint. So there are certain predecessor, predecessor that has to be completed first before we can start the element. So that's the meaning of precedence constraint or precedence relationship. So the same with work element four. Work element four can only be started after work element one and two has been completed. So it means you cannot start work four before you start work one and work two. All right, so the rest is uh, self-explanatory. Yeah? So for example, work element 12. Work element 12 can only be started after work element 11 has been completed. Okay, the same for work element 10, it can only start after work element eight and five has been completed. Okay, okay. So let's do line balancing now. Huh? So let me repeat again the purpose of line Doing line balancing is for us to reassign the work elements or redistribute the work elements into different workstation so that by doing that, uh, we will want to balance up the line so that by doing that, each workstation will have roughly the same amount of cycle time. Okay, so when each workstation has roughly the same amount of cycle time, then the line will be more balanced. When the right line is more balanced, bottlenecks can be. Reduce. Okay, bottlenecks can be improved. So there are three methods, three methods of doing line balancing. <coughs> uh, first method is the largest candidate rule. Second is cube bridge investors. Third is rank positional weights. Okay, now all these methods are what we call heuristic, eh? they are heuristic approach. <coughs> based on logic and common sense. Huh? Okay, what is heuristic approach? Heuristic approach means uh, you follow certain steps. Okay, it's not so mathematical, but then there are certain steps that you have to follow. And by following the steps, you will get the solution. That's the meaning of heuristic. Huh? Okay, and normally there's no guarantee of an optimum solution. Huh? If you use these three approaches, there is no guarantee that you will get the optimum solution. Most of the time, you will get what we call satisfactory solution. You can get good solution, satisfactory solution, but no guarantee that it is the optimum. Huh? 
Right, so let's look at the first one, huh? the first method, largest candidate rule, huh? LCR. So if you use this rule, work element will be assigned to workstations based on uh, the largest element time, huh? PE. Okay, actually largest, huh? largest. we need a largest here. Based on largest work element time, PE. So these are the steps that you have to follow. As I said, it's a heuristic, so you follow these steps. The first thing you do is you try to arrange all the work elements based on descending element time. Okay, each work element has their yeah, time, huh? as I said just now. So the first step is you arrange the work elements based on descending time order. So it means the work element with the highest time will be at the top, and the work elements with the Shortest time will be at the bottom, huh? All right? So that's the first step. Second step, to select the elements to the workstations. In other words, to assign the elements to the workstation, start from the top of the list. Okay, start from the top of the list. Okay, and whenever you select the element, huh, you must make sure that the selected element must fulfill the precedence constraint. Huh? It must not violate the precedence relationship. It must fulfill the precedence constraint and make sure the total element time does not exceed the cycle time. Okay, so remember two things. Huh? Remember two things. When you assign the elements to the workstation, make sure it conforms to the precedence constraint and make sure the total element time does not exceed the cycle time. And Next step, you just have to repeat. Next step is you continue the process. You repeat step one and step two until all the elements has been assigned. Okay, okay. So look at this now, real example. Huh? Let's say you have an assembly line, you have a production line, and the production line consists of 12 work elements. Okay, so these are work elements, huh? not workstation. We have really break down all the jobs into the most basic elements and in total the whole assembly line has 12 work elements and these are the element time huh, for each of the work element so it's called tej huh? tej is the time of a particular work element so work element one the time is 0 0.2 minutes work element two time is 0 0.4 minutes and so forth and over here, these are the precedence constraints. Okay, so if you look at it, element one can be started anytime, element two can be started anytime, but work element three can only be started after work element one has been completed. Okay, and work element four can only be started after work element one and two has been completed. So these are the predecessor, predecessor of the work element here. So, for example, work element 2 is the predecessor of work element 5. I hope you understand, huh? Okay, so you are given this. Then you are also given <coughs> this. Okay, so if you convert this into the precedence diagram, it will look like this. Huh? Okay, so you have work element 1, 2, 3, until 12. The cycle time are given here for each. Each work element, huh? so the cycle time for the first work element is 0 0.2, uh, the work element time for the second work element is 0 0.4, and so forth. Right? So these are TEJ, eh? sorry, not cycle time, but TEJ. These are TEJ, the work element time for each of the work elements. And by looking at this diagram, you will know the precedence, eh? the precedence requirement. Okay, so um, first step, arrange. <coughs> okay, arrange this in descending order. The one with the highest element time at the top, the one with the smallest element time at the bottom. Okay, so if I copy this over here, I hope you can see that. Eh? Oops. 
Okay, like this. Huh? So you are given this on the left. First step is you have to arrange the work element in descending order of the element time. That is the first step you have to do. Huh? So I don't have to explain this, right? You understand, right? So the one at the top is work element three because it has the highest element time, so 0 0.7. Followed by work element eight because the element time is 0 0.6. Okay, and so forth and so forth until the last one, huh? work element four. Work element four has the smallest element time, right? 0 0.1, so it's at the bottom. So you arrange them in descending order. Huh? Okay, and question also gives you this. Huh? Since the required cycle time, the required cycle time for every workstation is one minute or less than one minute. Okay, required cycle time huh? for every workstation is either one minute or less than one minute. Right, so given this information given the cycle time given given the precedence constraint okay how do we assign the uh, work element into separate workstations okay so this is what i will show you eh? i will discuss with you <coughs> i use the word far eh? okay so i already arranged them in descending order eh? i have already arranged them in descending order and remember the cycle time. Huh? Cycle time has to be smaller or equals to one minute. Huh? Okay. Okay. So what we do is we start with the first workstation. Okay, start with the workstation and then start to assign the elements to the first workstation. How do we start? We start at the top of the list because this is largest candidate rule. Huh? Means the candidate with the largest element time should be assigned first. That's why it's called largest candidate rule. Huh? Because the element with the largest element time should be assigned first. All right, so start from the top of the list. So ask yourself, can we assign element three to workstation one? Can or cannot? It has the highest cycle, highest element time. Can you assign three here? Uh, yeah, the answer is cannot. Uh. Why? Because uh, three cannot be started until one has been completed. Okay, it has a precedence constraint. Uh. So it means we cannot assign element three. Okay, okay, fine. Then move on to the second one. Can we assign element A? Cannot because three and four has not been started. Can we assign element 11? Cannot because nine and 10 cannot be started. So we go down the list. Can we assign element two? Can, right? Because there is no precedence constraint. So it means we can start element two at any time. Huh? So, for workstation one, the first element that we have to assign will be work element two. So work element two has a time of 0 0.4. Huh? Right? Understand? Huh? So once you have assigned element two, then you can cancel it. Huh? You can cancel it. Otherwise, you will get confused. Huh? So you cancel it, you just block it. Draw a line, you block it. Huh? Right, so now what we do, we go up the list again and we repeat the process. Now ask yourself, can we assign element three to workstation one? Can or cannot? Someone answer me. <clears throat> no, okay, because element one has not been started. Okay, then go down the list. Element eight, is it possible? Not possible. Element 11 possible? No, because nine and 10 has not been started. Element 10? Cannot. Element seven, cannot. Element five, can, eh? because uh, the precedence constraint is two. Two has already been started. Eh? So it means the next element we can assign to workstation one is element five. All right, so element five has an element time of 0 0.3. Eh? 
So once you have assigned element file, you can block it, you can cancel it. Okay, and you repeat the process, work the list again. Ask yourself, can I assign three? Cannot. Eight? Cannot. Eleven? Cannot. Ten? Cannot. Seven? Cannot. Nine? Can? Cannot. One? Can, huh? because one has no precedence requirement. So it means I can assign one. Okay, the element time for element one is 0 0.2, huh? so 0 0.2. Okay, so can we continue to assign elements to workstation one? We can, huh? as long as it does not exceed the cycle time. Huh? So the total time now is 0 0.4 plus 0 0.3 plus 0 0.2 is only 0 0.9. Okay, so maybe we can still fit in another element into workstation one, as long as it is between or within this limit, huh? either it's one minute or less than one minute. Right, so workstation one has been assigned, so you can cancel it. Okay, so go, go up the list again and check one by one. Element three, can I assign element three? Uh, I can assign element three because precedence is one, huh? one has been completed, but element three has a time of 0 0.7. Huh? So if you assign three, the time it takes will be 0 0.7. Huh? So if you total up this, it will exceed one minute, right? 0 0.4 plus 0 0.3 plus 0 0.2 plus 0 0.7, it will exceed one minute. So it means we cannot sign element three, yeah? Okay, understand, huh? So if you read back, if you read back this, huh? you have to make sure the elements that you select conform to the precedence constraint. And make sure the total element time uh, of that station does not exceed the cycle time. Okay, cycle time in exam uh, normally will be given. If we don't give you the cycle time, you have to calculate uh, how to calculate the cycle time using this formula. Uh. Okay, production time allocated divided by quantity. Right, okay, so let me continue. So I cannot assign work element three. Let's go down the list one by one. And I put eight, not 11, no 10, no seven. Seven cannot uh, because three has not been started. Nine cannot, 12 cannot, six cannot, four. Maybe yes, uh, four can uh, because one and two has already been started. So I can assign four, huh? and the element time is only 0 0.1. Then it fit nicely. Lah. So 0 0.4 plus 0 0.3 plus 0 0.2 plus 0 0.1, you get exactly one. Huh? So fine, okay? Because we have not exceeded the cycle time. So workstation time for station one is one now, okay? So workstation time is actually the total of the element time in that station. So the total of this, we get one. Huh? Okay, so we are done assigning elements to workstation one. Then we can start with workstation two. We can create another new workstation now. Let's call it workstation two. And we repeat the process. Okay, so four is cancelled again. Huh? So we repeat the process. So start with the top of the list. Ask yourself, can we, can we assign element three? Yes or no? Into workstation two. Yes, eh? okay. So workstation three can be assigned because uh precedence is one. Eh? So one is already started. All right? So one has really been completed. So means we can start with work element three. Eh? So it has element time of 0 0.7. Eh? So once you have assigned work element three, you can cancel it. Eh? You can cancel it. Okay, so go down the list now. Start with eight. Can we assign eight to workstation two? Uh, no, okay. Even though the precedence is satisfied, but then the element time is 0 0.6. Eh? So if we add element eight here, you will need to have 0 0.6. So 0 0.7 plus 0 0.6 will exceed one. Eh? 
so we cannot assign element eight. Okay, so go down again, then work element eleven. Can cannot work element ten. Cannot work element seven. Can we assign seven? Cannot, uh, because if we put seven, <coughs> the element time is zero point three two. Uh. So you total up this, it will exit one. Okay, we cannot exit the cycle time. Huh? So it means we cannot assign work element seven. Huh? Okay, so we continue, we go down the list. Nine, can we assign nine? Cannot because six, seven, eight has not been started. Can we assign work element 12? Cannot because 11 has not been started. Can we assign work element six? Okay, yes, huh? so six, we can assign six. Element time is 0 0.7. Okay, so we still have rooms. Huh? We still have rooms to assign more elements to workstation two. You have to check whether you can fit in more or not. Okay, so check again now. Go back to the repro up the list, check again. Okay, cancel six. Huh? Six has already been assigned. Huh? Okay, so now we are left with 8, 11, 10, 7, 9, 12. Okay, so go up to this and check. Can we assign 8 again here? Cannot, huh? because 0 0.6. If you total up with this, it will exceed 1. Huh? Can we assign 11? Cannot. 10? Cannot. 7? Cannot. Huh? 12? Cannot. So no, no more other elements can be assigned to workstation 2. Huh? Then we can close the workstation. Huh? In that case, so workstation is two is closed. So workstation two only consists of two elements. And the total workstation time is 0 0.81. Huh? Right, so now we can open up another station, workstation three now. And we try to assign the elements to workstation three. So how to assign, go to the top of the list huh? because we have arranged them in descending order, right? So go to the top of the list, start with 8, work element 8. Can we assign work element 8 to workstation 3? Can, huh? because workstation, uh, work element 3 and 4 has already been started. Huh? 3 and 4 has already been started. So it means we can start with element 8. Element time is 0 0.6. Okay, so once you have assigned 8, you can cancel it. Huh? Cancel it. So go up the list again, start with 11 now. Work 11, work element 11. Can we assign to workstation 3 now? Cannot because 9 and 10 has not been started. Uh, can we assign 10, work element 10? 10, right? Okay, then we assign 10. Huh? Okay, if you assign 10, uh, the precedence requirement is 5a, huh? so 5 is started, 8 is also started, so we can assign 10. Huh? So we assign 10. Okay, the element time is 0 0.38. So if we total up, it is still smaller than the cycle time, right? It is still within the cycle time. So the total station time now is 0 0.98. Okay, so you can cancel 10 now. Okay, ask yourself any other elements we can fit into workstation 3? <coughs> I think no more huh? because we cannot exit one minute. So if you add this 0 0.12, exit one minute. You add this, exit one minute, add this, exit one minute, add this, exit one minute, right? So in that case, we close workstation 3. Yeah? So let's start workstation four. Let's open up another workstation, workstation four. Okay, so repeat the process, go to the top of the list and ask, can I assign work elements 11 to workstation four? Cannot, okay, because nine has not been started. Huh? Nine has not been started. So 11 cannot. Then we go down the list, we see seven. So ask yourself, can we assign book element seven? Yes, huh? So assign book seven. Element time is 0 0.32.
Okay, so you can cancel books, element seven. Okay, and repeat the process, go up the list again, ask, can we assign 11 now? Book, 11, book element 11, still cannot because nine has not started. Then you go down, you see nine, huh? Can we assign nine? Okay, yes, uh, we can assign nine, right? Because six, seven, eight has been started. And the element time is only 0 0.27. So you assign nine. Element time 0 0.27. Oops. Okay. Okay. So any more elements we can fit into workstation four? <coughs> Okay, we only left with two, uh, 11 and 12. Can we uh, assign group element 11 in workstation 4? Uh, in terms of precedence, it's okay. But in terms of cycle time, it's not okay. Uh, because if we add in 11, 0 0.5, then the total workstation time will exceed 1. So it means we cannot add group element 11. Can we add book 11, 12 here? Cannot also, uh, because book element 11 has not been started. So it means we have no choice already. If no choice, then we have to start another new workstation, workstation 5. Okay, so if you calculate the workstation time for workstation 4, it is, good. It is equal to 0 0.59. Uh. Okay, so for workstation 5, I think it's very simple already. You only have it. Element 11 and 12, uh, so it means I will have to assign 11 first uh, because it's at the top of the list, right? So go for 11 first. In terms of precedence, it's satisfied already. 9 and 10 has been started already. So I can assign 11. 11 has an element time of 0 0.5. Okay, so once you have assigned 11, you can move it, you can cut it off. Right, so most of the element has really been assigned except for element 12. Huh? So it means the last choice is element 12. So we assign element 12 in workstation 5. Okay, element 12 have an element time of 0 0.12. Huh? So the station time now in station 5 is 0 0.5 plus 0 0.12, you get 0 0.62. Okay, so this is what we call line balancing. By doing that, by doing this, okay, we have tried to actually balance up the line uh, so that the workstation time uh, in every workstation is more balanced. And this is the best assignment that we can get uh, if you use the largest candidate rule. Workstation one consists of five, sorry, four elements. Workstation two, two elements. Workstation three, two elements. Workstation four and five, also two elements. Okay, any questions so far that you don't understand? Right, so if you look at it graphically, eh, it means something like this. Eh? It means these four jobs, four elements here are grouped in workstation one. So workstation one will complete these four elements. Workstation two will handle these two elements. Workstation four, these two. Workstation three, these two. Workstation five, these two. Okay, okay. So once you have this, you can also calculate the idle time. Huh? How to calculate idle time? Idle time is equals to, as I said, cycle time minus the workstation time. Huh? Okay, or the other way. If the other way, you get negative value. No problem. All right, so cycle time is one. So one minus the station time is zero. So for workstation one, there is no idle time. For workstation 2 is 1 minus 0 0.81, you get 0 0.19. Workstation 3, 1 minus 0 0.98, 0 0.02. Workstation 4, 1 minus 0 0.59, you get 0 0.41. Okay, so you calculate, you get all this. Huh? So this is the idle time. 
Right, so once you have done this, then you can calculate two more parameters. Normally, the question will ask you to calculate either line balancing loss or line balancing efficiency. So, how to calculate line balancing loss? Okay, line balancing loss. Eh? equals to n multiplied with cycle time minus total work content eh? pwc total work content is the total time of all the work elements and then divide back by n multiplied with cycle time okay so n is five eh? we have five workstation right number of workstation is five so you get five here Cycle time, as I say, the question has given you, which is one minute. So one minus total work content. This is the total of all the work element time. So the total of all the work element time is four. Huh? So it's this value or this value. Huh? So minus four and then divide back by n times cycle time, five times one. So you get zero point. Okay, so it means now this entire assembly line has about 20% loss. Okay, so the line balancing loss is 0.2, so about 20%. The smaller the value, the better. Eh? The larger the value, the worse. So imagine if your line is fully balanced, eh? for example, your line is fully balanced. For workstation one, the cycle time is one. For workstation two, the cycle time is also one. For workstation three is also one. One, one. Okay, if everything is one, then you will get line balancing loss equals to zero, huh? Because there is no loss. Okay, but I said before this is just not possible uh, in practice. Okay, because it's very seldom we can we can have all the workstation having the same cycle time. There must be a certain variation. Okay, and as I said before, if you use the largest candidate rule, LCR, this is the best assignment that we can get, which will give you a 20% line balancing loss. All right, so similarly, you can also calculate line balancing efficiency eh, using the second formula. So that one, I leave it to you. Eh? Okay, any question so far? Line balancing using largest candidate rule? Okay, if no, then move on to the second method. Second method is called Cuprish Investors. Okay, Cuprish Investor is also like I'll just scan the rule, uh, but then you have to do this first. Okay, you have to group the work elements into different hierarchical level in the precedence diagram. Huh? So build a precedence diagram in such a way that work elements that are in the same hierarchical level are aligned to the same column. Okay, so if you look at our precedence diagram, huh, we can actually separate them into columns. Okay, for example, work element one and two. Okay, both of them are at the top of the hierarchy, right? They can be started first. So group them into column one. Okay, and after that, you can see that work element three, four, and six can be started. So you group them into the second hierarchy, which is the second column. And then followed by six, seven, eight in the third hierarchy, which is the third column. And then followed by nine, ten eh? in the fourth column. And then book element eleven in the fifth column. And then lastly, book element twelve in the sixth column. That is the first thing you have to do eh? when you use the cubish investor. You have to group the work elements based on the hierarchy into separate columns. Okay, I think you understand it. That I don't have to explain. It's very easy. And then what you do next is you arrange the element based on the column. Just now in largest candidate rule, we arrange the element based on the 
element time eh, from highest to smallest. For incubation investor, we arrange the elements not based on the element time, eh, but based on the column. Okay, starting with the first column until the last column. Okay, so if you arrange them, then you will get this. Okay, I hope you can see if I copy this here. Okay, I think you can see, yeah. So you arrange them based on the column. Uh. So column one has element one and two, so you start with one and two. Column two has three, four, five, so you have three, four, five. Uh, column three has six, seven, eight, so six, seven, eight. Column four has nine, ten, so nine, ten. Column five has eleven, eleven, and then column six has twelve, twelve. So you arrange them based on the column. Okay, so when you arrange them based on column, make sure you also arrange the work element as well. Eh? The work element time and the precedence. Eh? The precedence has to follow. Eh? Okay, so once you have arranged them based on column, then you can start to do the assignment of the elements into workstation. Okay, starting from the top of the list and then going down the list. So whenever you assign the work elements to the workstation, make sure uh, the precedence constraint is not violated and make sure the total station time does not exceed the cycle time. Okay, okay. So can you do it for me? Just to make sure you understand. Okay, so I really put it here. This is the arrangement based on the column, based on the cube bridge and raster method. Okay, cycle time. Okay, cannot exceed one minute eh, for every workstation. Okay, so try to do the line balancing for me. Try to assign the work elements to the respective workstations and then tell me the answer. Eh? So I'll give you 10 minutes to do it. Later, I will call names eh? just to make sure all of you are participating in the class. Okay, 10 minutes start now. Please do it.
Okay, I think maybe we can start the discussion uh, to save time. Okay, so can anyone start? If nobody start, I will call names already. Uh. Book station one, what is the first element that we can assign? One, two, four, and five. Oh, one, two, four, five. Yes. Okay, that's very fast. One, two, four, five. Okay, you didn't refer to the notes, huh? You refer to the notes or what? Victor, they just answered. Huh? You refer to the notes. Because I already given you the notes in the e-learning. I didn't download it yet after the class. Okay, but you got it one, two, four, five, huh? Based on what I said just now, right? So correct. Yes. So one, two, four, five, huh? Workstation one should consist of one, two, four, five. So I just need to repeat again whatever assignment you make, make sure it does not exceed the cycle time. Okay, the total station time does not exceed the cycle time and make sure. Uh, you follow the precedence relationship. Uh, you don't violate the precedence constraints. Okay, so you have 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.1, 0 0.3, which is one. Uh, so total workstation is one. Total workstation time is one. Uh. Okay, for workstation two, workstation two, Okay, maybe I ask Amiro. Amiro, are you there? Okay, Amiro, Amiro Hazima, are you there? Not there, huh? not there. Okay, uh, next, Faisal, Faisal, are you there? Workstation two. Can you tell me the elements to be assigned to workstation two? Also not there. Okay, what about Fatinato? Aisha, are you there? Okay, Fatinato, Aisha, are you there? Also not there. Hafiz, Jiwanta, are you there? Okay, at least Hafiz, Jiwanta, give me a response. Three, six, eh? <coughs> Okay, three six, correct. So three zero point seven six zero point one one, huh? Eh? And get zero point eight one. Okay, three six, huh? We cannot fit in more, only three six. Workstation three. Which element should be assigned to workstation three? Yeah. Okay, after Rama, Ali says seven eight. Mama Daniel says seven eight. Okay, correct. Seven eight, huh? Seven is zero point three two. Eight is zero point six. So get zero point nine two. Huh? Okay, I I don't have to show you again. Huh? Step by step. Okay, one by one, go down and go up, and then remove it, cancel it. Okay, I already shown you once. Huh? So I hope I hope you understand. Huh? Okay, for workstation four, anyone has the answer? <coughs> I full I Ayman nine ten. Abdurrahman Ali also say nine ten, huh?
Okay, correct. 910. Huh? So 910. Okay, so 9 has 11 times 0 0.27, 10 has a time of 0 0.38. So this will give us 0 0.65. Huh? Okay, and the last workstation. Because we still have a few more elements to assign. 11, 12. Yeah, most of you say 11, 12. Huh? Okay, 11, 12, correct. So 11, 12. So 11, the time is 0 0.5, 12 is 0 0.12. And the workstation time will be 0 0.62. Huh? Okay. Okay. So this is the answer. Huh? This is the answer. So this is an assignment. Huh? The assignment of work elements into workstations. Right. So you can do the same thing. You can calculate the idle time. Okay. And then from there, you can calculate line balancing loss. You can also calculate line balancing efficiency. Right? So if you see line balancing loss, it's also 20%. Huh? Okay, so it means the uh, effectiveness of this method is just like the largest candidate rule. Huh? Okay, but the assignments are different. Huh? The assignment of elements to the workstations are different, right? If you use the Cubridge West. Western method compared to the largest candidate rule method. The assignment of elements are different, but the line balancing loss is the same, huh? still 20%. Um, generally, uh, generally, Cubridge and Western method can give a more satisfactory result than largest candidate, candidate rule method. However, it's not always possible to be so. Huh? So it's just like in this case, uh, in this case, they are about the same because line balancing loss is 20%. Okay, the next method, maybe I will cover it next week. Eh? It's called the rank positional weight method. Okay, so I will cover this uh, next week. Eh? But I hope you understand eh, the two methods that I discussed. <coughs> okay, we still have some time. I just want to go through the group project question with you. Eh? So I hope everybody have read the question. Very important that you have read the question because you really have to start doing it. Eh? Okay, why? Because you have to submit this. Okay, I need a brief proposal from every group. Eh? You have to submit by 21st April. Okay, which is, uh, I think, two weeks from now. Eh? Because I already uh, released the question last week. So actually, I've given you three weeks eh, to actually submit a brief proposal. So the brief proposal, you should include, okay, your team members, your team name, okay, the case study selected. Huh? So hopefully in the brief proposal, you can really tell me the name of the company. Okay, rational for selecting the company, the reasons for selecting the company, and give me the project gun chart huh? so that I know you're planning. And then on the 2nd June, you have to submit a pro progress report, interim report. And final report due on 30th June. Okay, so please remember to do this. Huh? So in terms of the questions, I think it's easy to understand. I don't think I have to explain much, right? So you just have to find a company. Okay, preferably a manufacturing company or a factory. If you cannot find a factory or manufacturing company, then go for a service company. Okay, because some service company, uh, they still do forecasting. Okay, they still have capacity planning and some of them also do scheduling. Okay, so it depends on your network, uh, depends on your contact with the industry. Either you get a manufacturing company or service company. Okay, so you have to set your objective, uh, because I cannot set the objective for you, because you have to solve the problem of the company. So whatever problem that you solve will become the objective. So you have to describe the objective in the report, the source of data, this is important, huh? how you get the data. 
is it through interview is it through documentation i mean do, do you look at the documents to collect the data or is it through interview or is it questionnaire or is it through some kind of video recording so you have to explain the source of data and also the assumptions that you made huh? so what you have to do is you have to solve three problems okay at least three problems huh, of the company and therefore you are expected to demonstrate the use of at least three different approaches that you learn in the course and one of the approaches must be a scheduling problem huh? must be a scheduling problem or scheduling approach okay so i hope you understand this doesn't mean that, uh, for example, I say three different problems. It doesn't mean that you have to solve one problem on forecasting, another problem on capacity planning, another problem of aggregate planning, another problem of scheduling, not like that. Eh? Okay, because you are expected to demonstrate at least the use of three different approaches. So, for example, eh, you can focus on forecasting, but forecasting alone, you demonstrate two approaches. And then maybe the next one is scheduling huh? because scheduling is a must. So in scheduling, you demonstrate another approach. So that will make up three approaches. Understand, right? So it doesn't mean that every chapter you need to demonstrate one approach. Okay, no. Huh? For example, capacity planning. Okay, you may demonstrate two approaches in capacity planning, solving two problems. And then one more is scheduling. So that will make up three. Okay, I hope you understand. Uh, final report is already mentioned here, the format. You have to submit it to turn it in. Eh? I hope you all know how to submit it to turn it in. Okay, so in fact, you have to attach the turn it in report also later to me. Eh? So the report must have less than 20% similarity index. So every group must submit their report to turn it in. Let turn it in generate the report and you have to submit the report, the turn it in report. Huh? So format of final report, these are just example guidelines. You can follow this or if you want to modify this, it's also fine. Huh? But try to stick with this. Huh? Try not to go too far from this format. Um, I need to remind you that you have to submit your reflections. Huh? Okay, in the appendices, you have to attach attach the gun chart, task assignment. I, I want to know which member is doing which task. And each of you uh, must write your reflections. Okay, you know what is reflection, right? Anyone doesn't know what is reflection? You ask you, you write your reflection, uh, for example, what have you learned in doing this group project? What is the obstacles that you face? Okay, how do you solve the obstacles? Okay, and how this group project helps you in your lifelong learning. That is important, huh? Because lifelong learning is one of the skills that will be evaluated in this course. So I want every one of you to write your reflections, how this project has actually helped you in improving your lifelong learning. So write that as your reflection. And on top of that, as I said, you can also write what have you learned, what are the obstacles that you face, and how have you solved the obstacles. Okay, and please try to use the ePortfolio to write your reflection. Okay, you know the ePortfolio? ePortfolio, huh? Okay, UTM has a system huh, called ePortfolio. It allows students to access the system and record down their reflection. So preferably, I want all of you to write your reflection in this ePortfolio system. And then when you submit your report, you just insert the link. Okay? When you have submitted your ePortfolio, uh, there should be a link, huh? the website link. So you give me that website link in your report. So every member just insert the website ePortfolio link.
So when I receive your report, soft copy, I click the link, I will access your e-portfolio and I will read your rejection from there. Okay, clear? Everything clear? Any question? Or if you have a previous uh, report, can you share it with us to take an idea? A previous report? I have no previous report. The previous report is kept by Dr. Sai. Okay, Dr. Sai Helmi is keeping the previous reports. I don't keep the reports. Okay, what, what do you need to know from the previous report? Take an idea. Of I, idea, I've given you idea already here. You see, the format of the final report, this is what you should do. Okay, now let, let me give you an example. For example, you've got a company. Okay, and the company may be doing some forecasting or may not be doing some forecasting. If the company is not doing forecasting and if they feel it's important, uh, then you do the forecasting for the company as your project. You can apply several methods that you learn, maybe two or three of them. To do the forecasting and then the last one is you have to work on the scheduling okay because scheduling is a must okay so that is if the company does not have forecasting you do it for the for the company but if the company already have forecasting they are already doing forecasting then you check the accuracy of their forecast maybe their forecast is not accurate uh, then how do you improve the accuracy okay so to improve the accuracy you try to apply what you learn in the class Okay, to forecast for the company and then check whether your forecast value are they more accurate or not. Okay, if you feel that those that you learned in the textbook is not enough, uh, then you have to read other sources. You have to read some journal papers to find techniques which are better and try to apply it in your project. Okay, understand? Huh? I've given you idea already. If the company have not done it, you do it for them. If the company already have some systems in place, then you look at it. Okay, what is the weakness in the system? Where can you improve on it? Okay, and you try to apply what you learn in the class to improve on what they are doing. Okay, if what you learn in the class is not enough for you to improve, then you will have to find other techniques through your lifelong learning. You will have to read journal papers, viral papers, to find what are the suitable methods that you can use. Okay, does that help, help help you to understand it better? I hope so. Eh? Okay, any other question before we stop? Okay, so if no, then stop here and see you on next Monday eh? at 4 p.m. Okay, you can leave. The class. Okay, thank you. Uh, in five minutes' time, you can scan your attendance. Huh? Five minutes' time. Okay, bye-bye. Okay, okay.